Okay. Uh, okay, Nicolas, I think uh, we're going to begin now okay. because everything is connected now. Okay, right. uh, Maria is going to give some more ideas. Maria. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon there, uh, Mr. Michelin. Uh, well, today's lecture is going to be about China Europe relations in the new Cold War challenges, frustrations, and missed opportunities given by our special guest, Mr. Nic uh, Nicolas Michelot. Uh, he is a 20-year veteran of Asia-Pacific business, finance, and economic research. Uh, Nicolas Michelon is the founder of Asia Intelligence Advisory, an economic and strategic intelligence consulting firm and chief editor of AsiaPowerWatch.com, an observatory of Asia-Pacific economic power. Currently based in Paris, Nicolas has worked for 15 years in Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan as an economist, financial analyst, portfolio manager, and more recently as a strategic intelligence consultant specialized in North Asia, meaning Japan and greater China. Nicolas is also a guest lecturer at Ecole de Guerre Economique, Paris School of Economic Warfare, and, and uh, uh, sorry, okay, and, and a speaker in various conferences in Asia and Europe. So thank you very much for your participation today, Mr. Uh, Nicolas. Uh, before uh, giving you the word, uh, Professor Carlos Aquino will present our uh, Center of Asian Studies. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Nicolas Michelin. Thanks again for accepting our conference. Just yes, before uh, giving you the floor, let me introduce briefly our Center of Asian Studies. Uh, San Marcos National University created the Center of Asian Studies two years ago. And uh, we have uh, of our aim to study the East Asian region, the Asian region. No? Uh, this region has become very important for the whole world, but especially for Peru. Just last year, for example, 46% uh, of all Peruvian export of goods went to Asia. And this uh, figure is increasing every year, where China, Japan, India are among our biggest partners. Not only that, investment for that region is also increasing a lot. Uh, but still not so much research has been done on that region. That's why uh, this uh, Center of Asian Studies was established. We have a pool of researchers, many of whom have uh, done postgraduate studies in China, Japan, and Korea, India, among other countries. Okay? So, uh, our aim is to study this Asian region to propose public policies so our country can take a better advantage of the opportunities offered for that region to conduct seminars, conferences like the one we're doing down now and uh, to publish report studies research on that subject. Uh, uh, in this opportunity, we're very glad to present Mr. Nicolas Chalon, as uh, Maria has said, he has uh, large uh, record of doing research uh, uh, on that area, consulting service, and so he's very well knowledge about that tema, and especially he's going to talk about a very interesting tema of china European relations. And this is uh, today's presentation, and before ending this uh, month, we also have two more presentations. On Monday uh, 21st, we're going to have a person from Indonesia, he's going to talk a very interesting subject. Indonesia is one of the biggest countries in the world and uh, has uh, been able to be a, a nation with no uh, any problems or religion problems, even if, uh, as these uh, conferences will tell us, it is uh, a country with multiple religions. Okay? And finishing this month, we will have the conference of two uh, big professor in the subject of Indo-Pacific region, Professor Raha Mohan, who is the director of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, and Professor Rory Metcalf, 
who is a head of the National Security College at the Australian National University, will talk about this very, very interesting subject that uh, uh, every time is uh, gaining more importance as it is the battleground of the geopolitical and strategic competition between United States and China. So we invite you also to attend this conference, okay? So now I am going to stop the presentation here and I'm giving the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Nicolas Michelon, please. Uh, professor, sorry, before starting, just to say that after uh, Professor Michelon uh, talk, we will have a round of questions and, and, and your comments, of course, first. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Aquino, and thank you, Mrs. Maria Ostolo. I would like to thank you, both of you, and uh, the whole team at the Centro de Estudios Asiáticos of uh, San Marcos University for extending this invitation. Uh, I have to say that I'm very pleased with the calendar of, uh, of this presentation because the, the calendar has been very rich uh, in events that are telling us a lot about the state of the relations uh, between, uh, between Europe and, uh, and China. Um, Basically, there are two major events that I'm going to focus on, at least at the beginning of this presentation, uh, which is the five country tour that the Chinese foreign minister, Mr. Wang Yi, took uh, at the very uh, last week of August. And we're going to pair that up with uh, the virtual summit that happened last Monday between three of the top uh, people within the European Union uh, governing, governing bodies and uh, President Xi Jinping. Basically, uh, we could summarize um, those two events with one sentence that was pronounced by the head of the European Council, Mr. Charles Michel, right after the virtual summit. And I'm going to quote him because there's no way to say it in a clearer way than what he, in the way he said it. Europe is a player, not a playing field. Uh, what did he mean by this? Uh, he gave a very clear uh, message to Beijing that there is, at least from a European perspective, there is a very dire lack of reciprocity in the trade and business relationship between Europe and China. This is uh, being felt very strongly by European authorities and most of the European business community uh, over the past, that's been going on over the past five to 10 years. And I'm gonna go into more details about you know, the real reasons why uh, there is this feeling in Europe that there's a major lack of reciprocity. But this is really one of the main message that Europe has, has been trying to put out uh, in this post-COVID-19 world to the, the Chinese side, to their Chinese partners. So basically, we're going to start uh, very quickly with the five country tour that uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi took in, uh, in Europe on the very last week of August. Basically, this tour took him to Italy, Netherlands, Norway, France and Germany. Uh, the countries that were chosen, actually, they were not chosen by, uh, by mistake. Uh, the fact that Foreign Minister Wang Yi started with Italy is quite telling in the sense that Italy has been, uh, at least for the past two or three years, probably the most pro-China and pro-Belt and Road Initiative country in Europe. Uh, there's a very simple reason for that, and I think uh, the Chinese side is not mistaken about this, at least I'm hoping they're not. Uh, it is really a, a very clear way for the right-wing populist government in Italy to tell Brussels that if you keep coming after us for the policies we're trying to put out uh, when it comes to how to deal with migrant waves from Muslim countries, on how to deal with public debt, how to deal with restructuring the social, uh, the social service network in, in Italy, um, Basically, we have other people to talk to. We don't have to talk to only Brussels. Some people are knocking on our door, uh, namely China. And it's very interesting to notice that Italy was one of the first countries, if not the first in Europe, to sign a memorandum of an understanding with China uh, regarding their involvement in uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. So the fact that the Foreign Minister Wang Yi started with Italy uh, sent a very clear message to Brussels we're coming to you, but we're going to start talking to the people who like us the most first. Uh, another country that was quite interesting uh, that was included in this tour was Norway. Uh, Norway, as you know, is not part of the European Union, uh, never has and most likely never will. Um, 
why did Foreign Minister Wang Yi include Norway? And that's actually one of the first countries he went to during his tour. He didn't keep it for the end of the tour. Two reasons for this. Uh, first, very like, I would say very direct reason. Uh, Norway is obviously an Arctic power. China has Arctic ambitions. It considers itself a near Arctic power. So you wanted to make it clear that it, in the post COVID-19 world, China will still be claiming interests in the Arctic. And they wanted to make it very clear with one of the European countries that has one of the biggest interests in the Arctic. But the second reason is also to tell Brussels and to tell some of the largest countries like Germany and France that China considers Europe as something bigger than just the European Union. They know that some countries are not part of it. Uh, Great Britain is coming out of it now. Uh, so they are telling basically Brussels, we are willing to talk to people outside of Brussels. They know and they expect that there's a lot of resistance and there will continue to be a lot of resistance in Brussels. So they are willing to talk to other countries outside of the EU and even to countries directly to make sure that the balance of power is in their, uh, in their interest and that they don't get uh, you know, in a deadlock with a huge economic entity uh, like the European Union. So that's really one thing to notice on how this five uh, country tour was structured. Uh, in terms of content, it was very interesting to see that initially um, the, the objective was obviously to go on a damage control mission uh, to Europe. Damage control because of the large amount of criticism uh, that the European leaders have had regarding Chinese management of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, also damage control to see how far the United States have been able to whisper in European ears and convince Europe to stay on the US side of the trade war and the tech war that is coming. Um, to say the least, this tour has been less than successful. Uh, we have seen actually a mix of conciliatory and threatening tones from the Chinese side. Um, the Chinese ambassador to the European Union has been, I would say, the good cop in this game. And you've had a whole series, a whole flurry of uh, Chinese media, uh, starting with the Global Times, who were playing the bad cop. Uh, with very aggressive tone, uh, considering Europe as a weak partner, as a partner that didn't really have any choice but to cozy up with China, as a partner that had to free itself from U.S. influence. So for the whole tour, uh, uh, the European uh, partners were kind of facing both conciliatory tone and threatening tone, depending on the, on the issue discussed. Uh, now we can uh, talk about the virtual summit that happened uh, on Monday this week. Uh, this virtual summit was, I would say, an even bigger failure than the five-day tour by Foreign Minister Wang Yi. It was a bigger failure. Uh, if you look at uh, the wording from the European participants, namely um, the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, and also, uh, again, um, a European Council President Charles Michel. The words that came out of their mouth after the virtual summit in front of the European press were very tough, were very terse. Uh, especially Ursula von der Leyen, uh, President of the European Commission, she actually said, and I'm going to quote her uh, again, that the whole point of this virtual summit was to rebalance the symmetry was to find again a symmetry, a balance in the relationship between the European Union and China. It was not about meeting halfway. The message was that Europe is tired of China trying to meet us halfway. They're saying meeting us halfway, making concessions, is not good enough anymore. We have to find a perfect balance in our relationship. And until we do find that balance, we're not going to be happy with half-baked, uh, you know, decisions, what is actually considered by the European side as half-baked. So basically, in the end, uh, we have a clear failure at these damage control uh, attempts from the Chinese side at the end of August and, uh, and, uh, and earlier this week. And now I'm going to talk about some what I do believe are the four main issues uh, that are, are actually a thorn in the thigh of the Europe-China relationship. 
The first one is clearly trade and investment reciprocity. The, the topic of reciprocity. So basically the idea that what China is allowed to do in Europe does not work the other way around. The Europeans are not being allowed to do the same thing in China. And this has become a huge problem. And this goes way beyond uh, current account surpluses that China is running on the structural basis. Uh, it's, it's a matter of principle. And we'll see later in my presentation that Europe is adamant that we need to go back to a principle-based type of relationship before talking about details of which sector is open, uh, which company can you buy, which company you cannot buy. Uh, obviously, the first issue is tariffs and non-tariffs, mostly non-tariffs. Um, it's quite interesting that uh, literally the day before the virtual summit started uh, last Monday, uh, China banned German pork exports to China. So the, we started basically the whole summit, which was supposed to be a major step forward in the negotiation. Uh, we started by a new Chinese ban on a different kind of European exports to their country. So not a very subtle, not a very nice way of starting the negotiation. But the main crux of the problem was uh, what we call the Comprehensive Agreement on Investment, CAI. The CAI is basically something that's been in under negotiation between Europe and China over the past seven years. The idea was to replace the old bilateral investment treaties that existed between individual European countries and China prior to the Lisbon Treaty uh, being uh, uh, adopted in 2009. What the Lisbon Treaty did very quickly is that it transferred uh, competence in terms of uh, investment policy from the national governments in Europe to the commission level in Brussels. So there was a need to renegotiate everything because Europe considered that the old bilateral investment treaties uh, were becoming basically outdated and they needed, be, they needed to be replaced. This CAI has been under negotiation for seven years. The expectation from the European side was that we would finally see some progress in this uh, negotiation. And I'm going to read something else because, again, the wording is extremely clear. What I'm going to read to you is uh, basically a document that was put out by the European Chamber of Commerce in China. I'm going to read it first, and then we're going to, we're going to try and remind, you know, what does the Chamber of Commerce does and that why this wording is surprising uh, coming from such uh, an authority. They're saying, and I'm quoting, lack of reciprocity in access to the Chinese market and the absence of a level playing field for European investors in China have posed major challenges for EU-China investment relations in recent years, with the negotiation of a comprehensive agreement on investment, CAI, being considered by the EU a key instrument to remedy this state of play. And they go on by saying, and I quote again, Although leaders at the 2019 EU-China summit jointly committed to concluding the CAI talks in 2020, lack of engagement at the highest political level on the Chinese side has raised doubts as to whether a breakthrough can be reached in time, with China more focused on navigating the uncertainties of its relations with the United States. This comes again from the European Chamber of Commerce in China. We all know what chambers of commerce do. They're not there to pick a fight. Uh, they're there to try and make it easier to do business together. Uh, business makes everybody happier, uh, peace in the world, uh, all the people are friends, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is really the kind of very terse wording that you do not expect from a chamber of commerce. And yet this comes directly from them. So there is at this level and at the very I would say lower uh, echelons of the business communities in, uh, in Europe, including those uh, present in China, there is this recognition that we are going nowhere in these negotiations. Uh, we need to make real progress and timing is running out. Seven years of negotiations already. This takes me to uh, another issue and I'm going into, into more details, which is, uh, the Chinese policy when it comes to foreign direct investment controls. So basically, how does China and through, uh, um, uh, through, um, through its bodies, which is Ministry of Commerce, MOFCOM, what they call the negative lists, uh, how does MOFCOM control who 
invests in what and what is allowed uh, in terms of foreign investment or in terms of majority controls. Throughout the seven years uh, of negotiation for the CAI, one of the major demands uh, has been, of course, that MOFCOM loosens the negative list, that they uh, basically reduce the length of the negative list, that they open up more sectors to foreign direct investment, and in particularly to uh, European investors. To be fair, things have been happening. MOFCOM has been reducing the list. Again, last June, they've announced a new negative list, which is much shorter. I'm going to give you some very, uh, very uh, precise examples. Since June, foreign companies can now invest in companies managing nuclear fuel production and radioactive minerals processing. They can invest in urban water supply drainage networks. They can invest in tobacco products. They can invest in traffic control. Um, even better, foreign companies can now fully own securities companies in China. They can fully own futures companies. They can fully own life insurance companies, for example. So there has been some opening. Uh, it, it wouldn't be fair to say that MOFCOM has not moved one iota on this ground. The problem is that, at least from a European standpoint, the main criticism is that, is this too little too late? In the sense that we notice that what MOFCOM tends to do is that they tend to wait and ensure that their own national companies establish market dominance before allowing foreign uh, companies to invest in them. So what a lot of European investors is saying that, thank you for this new list, it's shorter than the previous one, but basically what you're telling me is that you're now allowing me to do a transaction that you know full well will never happen. Because those companies of yours in China have become so dominant in that sector that there's no way that we can purchase them or that we can invest in them. So that's one of the main criticism. Uh, negative lists have come down, have been reduced, but timidly and in a way that it doesn't change much on the ground. Um, another uh, issue in terms of reciprocity, it's what we have been witnessing uh, happening in terms of Chinese attempts at purchasing European strategic assets over the past five to seven years. Uh, I'm gonna give you uh, one example uh, that I worked on uh, very precisely because this example really embodies uh, one of the strategy and I'm really not saying that this is the main strategy and that the Chinese investors are always doing it this way, but this particular example uh, came really as a shock to Germany in particular and to Europe in general uh, because of a very um, specific way of uh, approaching a target uh, and, uh, and basically considering it as a prey. And I'm going to be talking about the case of Extron. Extron is a German semiconductor company uh, that up until 2014 was relying quite heavily on one major Chinese client, which was called uh, Sanan Optoelectronics out of Fujian province. What happened is that towards the end of 2014, Sanan Optoelectronics placed massive orders to Extron. So that propped up Extron stocks up massively. And then suddenly they canceled all the orders. What happened is that between the end of 2014, when Sanan Optoelectronics canceled massively all their orders to Extron and the mid of 2015, the stock price of Extron collapsed, understandably so. And in May of 2015, who comes knocking on the door of Extron? Another Chinese company called Fujian Grand Chip, also from Fujian province, offering to take over Extron at bargain stock price. Technically, nothing wrong with that. I mean, two private Chinese companies, one has a business issue with a German company, another one comes later, six months later, and offers to take over. But what the German authorities realized is that not only were these two companies not really private, actually Fujian Grand Ship was owned very discreetly by uh, a Fujian uh, authority called uh, Siamen Bohao, uh, up to 49% of it was owned by Siamen Bohao, which is a state-owned uh, entity. But they also discovered that Sanan Optoelectronics, the first private company who canceled the orders, which took the stock of Extron down, that company was being financed 
by the same Siam and Bohal state-owned company. So it started to look very clearly to the German authorities that what those two companies were doing were basically manufacturing a prey, manufacturing an easy target by destabilizing a European strategic company in the semiconductor industry. And then another one would come in and offer to buy. Hopefully, uh, luckily, the German authorities realized that at the right time, they blocked the transaction. Very interestingly, the US authorities collaborated with the German authorities on this very case, and they also blocked the potential takeover of Extron US subsidiary by Fujian Grenchip. So in that case, Europe and the US reacted in the same way at the same time on the same, uh, on the same dossier to protect what is considered in Europe a strategic asset because it's a semiconductor company. I'm talking about this example because, again, uh, this made a lot of noise um, uh, in Europe. And it started sending the signal in Europe that uh, when China was talking about win-win relationships, uh, shared common destiny, it was not totally devoid of very voracious appetite and that some of those companies are willing to basically do what is considered uh, that should not be done in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, uh, competition law in Europe. And another thing that, um, that the Europeans started to realize is that whenever a Chinese private company comes knocking, there might be public interest behind it. Uh, so really in terms of trust, that trust started deteriorating very fast from uh, that moment on. And then after Extron, then we started seeing a whole series of transactions that were uh, canceled by European authorities, by different countries. Uh, so Extron was canceled. Uh, when State Grid Corporation of China tried to take over Eondis, which is a, a major utilities company in Belgium, uh, the Belgian government blocked that transaction, considering uh, the utilities and power distribution as uh, strategic. So that transaction was blocked. And more transactions were blocked in Germany, in the machinery sector, in the utilities sector. So you started having barriers being raised by European countries. And it's not by chance that since 2019, we finally start having what is looking like a Europe-wide policy and strategy and legislation towards controlling foreign investment into uh, European strategic assets, which was not the case before 2019. Before 2019, basically, each individual European country was left alone do it, trying to enforce their own regulation, meaning that Europe was presenting a lot of weak uh, links to outside, uh, to outside investors trying to take over uh, strategic assets. So this is something that has been really a thorn in the thigh of, uh, of uh, EU uh, China relation. A second aspect of the problem is what we could call technological and information nationalism. So basically, uh, uh, the expression of power through the mastering of technology and through uh, the attempt at taking over another con uh, competitor's technology. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use three examples here that are I think the two the, the the first two ones are very well known. Uh, the first one is obviously Huawei. Uh, the whole question, which is also uh, being asked in Latin America, as far as I hear, the question of should we allow Huawei in the deployment of 5G, yes or no? Obviously, the US has been whispering uh, very loudly um, in uh, Europeans' ears about that, uh, uh, trying to convince European uh, decision makers to ban Huawei altogether. For a long while, uh, Europeans were really not convinced by the arguments that the, that the US authorities were presenting. They were saying, okay, show us proof that Huawei is a danger to national security in Europe. And for a long while, the proof was not being presented to them in a very clear way. So you had countries which were uh, really hesitant to let Huawei in. Some other countries were like, I'm sorry, I don't see any reason why I should not let them in. I mean, the market in Europe is, uh, is a free market, free competition. So why should it not be allowed at least to, uh, to run uh, against, uh, you know, against uh, other, other players? The thing is, over the past two years, and there's been an acceleration around, um, around the, the COVID-19 uh, 
um, the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Europeans seem to be making their mind very quickly now. Uh, if you look at a map of individual European countries and their stance right now, uh, when it comes to Huawei, a lot of them have gone from neutral, if not slightly favorable to Huawei, to very skeptical, if not downright uh, in opposition to Huawei being, uh, being allowed in the deployment of 5G. Uh, France is a very good example, my home country. Um, the, 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 the chief executive uh, officer of Orange, which is the largest telecom operator in France, uh, less than a year ago was saying uh, this whole thing about Huawei, it's starting to look like a witch hunt. Uh, we don't have any proof that this is a, a, a company that poses any risk uh, to national security in France. And now we, are, we have a, a new set of decisions uh, which basically say that uh, Huawei is de facto excluded from long-term uh, 5G presence in France um, in the sense that Huawei uh, license will not be renewed once they expire, which means that de facto Huawei will be phased out of 5G in France by 2028. Uh, the UK government before was watching Huawei uh, very closely. Uh, they were actually uh, forcing Huawei to give away uh, a lot of codes uh, to analyze the code and to see if there were no like Trojan horses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now the UK government has basically said very clearly that Huawei is excluded from 5G network uh, and will have to remove all of their gear by 2027. Denmark is the same. Uh, it's, uh, it has asked all the suppliers in the country to exclude Huawei from, uh, from providing hardware. Same in the Czech Republic. The Czech Republic was actually one of the, one of the first country uh, who expressed uh, open opposition to Huawei involvement in 5G in their country. And they were actually asking uh, uh, all the public servants to refrain from using Huawei and ZT hardware. Uh, so country after country in Europe uh, um, European members are turning against Huawei. Uh, can, can we say with certainty that they are simply falling under U.S. Uh, influence on this? It's obviously that the U.S. Uh, voice has been, um, you know, has been very present. Uh, they haven't left European countries, European governments decide on their own. But it seems to be, to me, that this whole issue on trade investment reciprocity is putting Europeans in a very bad mood when it comes to allowing or at least uh, giving the benefit of the doubt to Chinese companies. So I do think that a company like Huawei is paying the price of what Beijing has been doing and the way they've been doing it uh, in their relationship with Europe. Another example um, is TikTok. TikTok, uh, as you know, it's being banned uh, in the US uh, very clearly. For the moment, European uh, governments are refusing to ban TikTok. Basically, they're telling the U.S. guys, uh, we don't see the problem with TikTok. We don't see any problem different than the problems that the likes of Google or Facebook pose, basically. Uh, it, to us, it's no worse than Facebook. Um, they are obviously doing big data. They are gathering a massive amount on inf of information on their users. But hey, Facebook does that too. I mean, uh, it's not, not news for us. So we don't see a reason to ban them, uh, to ban them uh, uh, currently. They're actually saying that it's a relatively benign application. Uh, so for the moment, TikTok is basically, uh, is basically okay in Europe. They are gonna be watched more carefully because of the amount of information they're gathering on, on their users. Uh, but the argument that the US is presenting to Europeans uh, being information nationalism, meaning that you should be careful because any Chinese company by law has to agree to collaborate with the Chinese military uh, since the implementation of the new national intelligence legislation in 2017. For the moment, the Europeans say, okay, we need to see proof of that. So TikTok is off the hook for the moment, but it may not last. We'll see, time will tell. The third example, and that's only starting to unfold as we speak now, uh, so it's going to be extremely interesting to see where this takes us, is the case of Zhenhua Data. Zhenhua Data is this Shenzhen-based uh, uh, big data company. And it appears now there are leaks showing that Zhenhua Data has been gathering uh, big data on millions and millions 
of people throughout the world and mostly throughout the Western hemisphere. Uh, we're talking about big data on politicians, on media and entertainment people, on military, on members of royal families, uh, um, uh, important people in the technology sector, in academia. This is, I do believe that this has the potential to be the next WikiLeaks of the next Panama Papers. Uh, it's extremely worrying. One very interesting uh, uh, fact is that we're starting to have those leaks coming out of Italy. You remember that I, I told you that Italy it has been for the past few years one of the most pro-China, pro-Belt and Road Initiative country in Europe. Now, some media in Italy are digging into this Genoa data uh, scandal, what, is, what could become a scandal very soon. And they're showing that in Italy, Genoa data has been actually collecting information also on members of organized crime, members of the Italian mafia. What are they going to do with this information? It's getting really uh, worrying for European leaders, uh, especially when you remember that if Genoa data is being asked by the Chinese military to pass over the information, by law, they have to comply. And by law, they have to keep it secret that they had to comply. So there's a major uh, worry there. Uh, it's certainly, again, not putting European leaders in the best of moods to renegotiate uh, uh, the, the, the investment treaty with, uh, with China. And there is this major uh, Damocles sword hanging over now every Chinese technology company who comes knocking on European doors. Uh, everybody's looking at them now, basically asking them, who are you really working for? And what guarantee can you give me that if you're being asked by the People's Liberation Army to pass over information, what guarantee do you have that you will not do it? And now we know fully well, since we know more about this national uh, intelligence legislation passed in China in 2017, we know fully well that they are not allowed to say no, they have no way of saying no. So that's really uh, another, uh, another contentious issue. The third issue, I would say category of issues uh, is, uh, and this was really reminded to me by an American professor who knows China really well. And he reminded me this, uh, there is a major conflict between uh, the Chinese and the Europeans in terms of negotiation culture. China is very interest-based a negotiation culture. They come with a specific interest, they put their power behind it, and they see if they can negotiate in their favor. Europeans are very value-based negotiators, or what some people could say principle-based. We want to make sure first that we agree on a basic set of values, a basic set of principles, and then we can negotiate on specific points. And it's becoming now extremely difficult to have a pacified uh, negotiation uh, uh, a channel between Europeans and uh, Chinese partners because there is an increasingly uh, more violent clash in terms of values. The Chinese want to talk strictly about, for example, the comprehensive agreement on investments when the Europeans insist that before talking about the details of CAI, what's going on in Xinjiang? What's going on in Hong Kong? What's going on with Taiwan? We cannot go back to our constituents being democracies and tell them that, okay, we're gonna be allowed to invest more in China when there are still questions being asked about Xinjiang, about Hong Kong, about Taiwan. And this is making uh, a dialogue between Europeans and Chinese close to impossible now. Uh, this is exactly what I meant by threatening tones from the Chinese when they came to Europe. Every time in every country they were going to, questions were asked about what's going on in Xinjiang, what's going on with national security legislation in Hong Kong. Even Italians, the, the Italian foreign ministry, Di Maio, uh, which, is, which cannot be accused of being anti-Chinese by far, uh, even said that we are concerned by what we hear is happening, could be happening in Xinjiang. Can you tell us more about this? And it, it gets the Chinese curious every time. So this question of values, of a value-based negotiation or principle-based negotiation is, is making the whole dialogue close to impossible. It's come to the point that 
it's not only uh, political leaders who are asking the question. It's not only the media. I mean, the, it's the job of the media to ask those questions. Now you have European business leaders mentioning this question of values when they talk business with their Chinese partners. A very clear example, but it couldn't get any bigger and any clearer than this. The chief executive of German multinational Siemens, he said in the press that he is worried about what's happening in Xinjiang. He is worried about what does the national security legislation in Hong Kong, what does that represent in terms of freedom of speech, in terms of ease of doing business in Hong Kong. And he's saying that this could have an impact on how Siemens does business in China. We're talking about Siemens. We're not talking about some small family-owned industrial company uh, in Germany. We're talking about Siemens. And even the CEO is talking about that openly now. So the Chinese are furious every time it's being mentioned and the Europeans don't seem to bother getting the Chinese furious and they don't seem to hesitate in actually mentioning these contentious issues. So this is something that we're gonna have to be watching very closely. Uh, of course, uh, it could be a game that the Europeans are playing because as I said, they have to go back to their constituents. So they have to, to be able to say, at the next presidential election, at the next regional election, the next European election, they have to be able to say, uh, I have talked about this. I, I am trying to sort it out. I am trying to make it clear to the Chinese that we don't like what they are doing in Xinjiang. Uh, but it, this is gonna have a real impact on the quality of, uh, of the communication and the quality of the economic relationship between China and the EU. No doubt about that. No, absolutely no doubt about that. And then the fourth and last element of contentious, uh, and this is the first three were really getting structural. This one, uh, it's, it's really about the news. It's really about what's been going on over the past six months and what's been making our life so uh, unpleasant over the past six months. It's the way China has been managing COVID-19, managing the disease itself and managing the, its communication over the disease. And the way Europe has been a field for information warfare between the US and China over COVID-19. And Europe is finding it extremely unpleasant. Uh, this is exactly what Charles Michel said when he said Europe is a player, not a playing field. Uh, Europe is finding, is finding it very unpleasant to be considered as just a battleground. Uh, I was, uh, I was uh, covering the, the, the last part of, uh, of my presentation, which is the, the issues that the Europeans have been having with the way COVID-19 has been managed uh, by uh, the Chinese authorities and the way the communication around it has been managed, what we could call a real information warfare. Uh, the first part of it was really the mask diplomacy. So basically, China's, China's saying, uh, we're coming to the rescue, you know, we're sending all this uh, medical equipment uh, for free, we're gonna help you. Probably on, only we are able to, uh, to help the countries that are the most affected. Um, it did work to, uh, to a certain extent, at least in the beginning of the pandemic in Europe, in the beginning of the lockdowns in Europe. And I'm thinking in particular about Italy, uh, which was one of the countries that was the most affected uh, right away uh, starting, uh, uh, starting at the end of February, and they were in full lockdown very quickly, uh, the numbers of casualties rising up through the roof very fast. Um, it did work to a point. The problem is that uh, the Europeans felt very rapidly that there was a, a, a confusion, almost on purpose, between what China was giving away in terms of medical equipment to countries and what Chinese companies were actually selling on a typical business uh, on a typical business basis. Um, a lot of the, the populations in Europe initially thought that China was being very generous, you know, giving away masks, the hundreds of thousands of masks, respirators, etc. And then when we realized that a lot of it was not being given away, was actually being sold on a, on a typical, normal, uh, you know, business basis. And some countries, and namely the first one who started uh, communicating about this, namely Spain and Netherlands, the Netherlands and Norway, started not only rectifying uh, this false impression that they were receiving equipment for free. They're saying that they were saying, no, no, we're not, uh, we're not receiving it for free. We fully paid for it. And they said, not only did we pay for it, but a lot of it, it's actually subpar in quality and a lot of it is defective. And you started having these terrible 
uh, news articles all over the news in Spain, in the Netherlands, in Norway, and being actually uh, covered also in the media in other European countries, saying that uh, we have to pay full price, and it's not even uh, it's not even in a good standard. We're talking about a management of a pandemic. So around April of this year, the um, the public opinion starting switching completely from looking at China as the country uh, that could be set as an example on how to manage the pandemic and a country that was helping others. And that image totally collapsed very rapidly into this is the country where the pandemic started. So we started getting critical as uh, how come you didn't let the uh, WHO know sooner? How come WHO didn't react sooner, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, you've heard about that in Latin America too. And also that uh, you're selling us the equipment and you're selling us bad equipment. So uh, the public opinion was very disappointed and started turning against Chinese authorities around April. And that's really when uh, probably the U.S. noticed that and is starting ramping up their own uh, information warfare and the Chinese ramped up their own information warfare at the same time. And we in Europe starting being deafened by information warfare coming from both sides. The Chinese basically accusing, going as far as saying that probably the U.S. military created COVID and released it on purpose in Wuhan to try and bring China down to their knees. They even suggested that maybe COVID started in Italy because everybody knows that Italians are disorganized, that they're not serious people, so it wouldn't be surprising. Um, Europeans took it very badly, these kind of accusations, especially the accusation that it, could have, that it may have started in Italy. Um, and then on the other side, the US were fighting this information warfare coming from China, and they were feeding us, you know, uh, opposite information. So we were really like stuck between two uh, campaigns of information warfare. It became very, very aggressive on Twitter. Uh, I don't know if you have, uh, if any of you uh, did follow uh, the Twitter accounts from several of the Chinese embassies in Europe. The Chinese embassy in France was probably, uh, would probably win the gold medal in terms of uh, aggressiveness in their information warfare. Um, the Chinese ambassador allowed a tweet to come out of the Chinese embassy account in France, actu actually accusing the French government of letting elderly people in France die from starvation and die from COVID uh, without being offered any help in community uh, retirement homes. Uh, this became so bad that the French foreign minister actually summoned the Chinese ambassador uh, at the Quai d'Orsay to tell him that not only will you remove those tweets, but you will put out tweets saying that this was uh, actually uh, a lie, that this is not what's going on in France, and you will not repeat this kind of experience. It became extremely aggressive. And this all falls down uh, in this category of what we call wolf warrior diplomacy. Uh, uh, again, uh, I'm always talking from a European perspective, and I think that's the value that I can bring here today. From a European perspective, uh, we really got very quickly the feeling that what Beijing uh, was doing when approaching us uh, during the COVID crisis and even continuing now, it's really you are with us or against us. Uh, we have the feeling that China now is taking us back to the George W. Bush years of the second invasion of Iraq after 9-11. You are with us or against us. You are our friends and you are blindly our friends or you become our enemies and our arch enemies. Uh, this is the feeling that we have now. Um, and actually, a lot of the uh, China watchers that I talk to are telling me, uh, Nicholas, we have to be careful. Uh, we tend to see China as an old culture, old civilization. It is true. But in terms of politics, it is a very recent political culture that they have developed. It is a very communist political culture. So they fall very quickly, probably even quicker than the U.S., into this with us or against us rhetoric. And this is becoming another problem for the communication we have. Any criticism, any doubts that is expressed is being taken as a sign that we are becoming enemies. So at least this is the European point of view and this is the way uh, is being felt in Europe. 
Uh, and I think if it is not indeed what China is trying to put out as a message, it's very important that we dissipate this misunderstanding because the misunderstanding is becoming uh, very big and it's clouding, I think, the judgment of many, uh, of many leaders, both in China and in Europe. So to wrap it up uh, and to, uh, you know, to, to end uh, this presentation, uh, I, I would like to basically summarize uh, the way Europeans have been uh, seeing their, their new relationship with China. We are feeling, uh, our leaders are feeling that China, just like the US before, uh, have come to play a divide and conquer game, a divide and conquer strategy. Divide and conquer trying to steer us away from the US and the US have been trying to do that to steer us away from Russia. Um, so we are feeling that we're getting the same deal with China as we got with the US. No better, no better. Whereas before the pandemic, there was always this sense, at least among some elites in Europe, that having a China option, it's extremely interesting because it allows us, and I think it's probably the thinking that is already very widespread in Latin America, it allows us to minimize our dependence on the US. It's better to have two trade partners than just one. But the feeling we get is that the deal is no better, is no better. So they're trying to separate us from the US and they're trying to a draw a wedge within the EU. They're trying to talk mostly to Italy, to Portugal, to Greece, for example, countries that have been very weakened by the economic crisis after 2008. Uh, they have been having the, hard, the biggest difficulties getting back on their feet. And they're trying to use that to push Belt and Road Initiative, to push their influence. And it's, trying, it's starting to drive a wedge. Uh, another, uh, another issue, um, is that uh, this aggressiveness that uh, China has been exhibiting in their uh, information warfare, it's starting to have the reverse desired effect. A lot of the populations, a lot of the leaders, a lot of the, of the party leaders in the European Parliament are really turning, uh, at the very least, uh, China skeptical, if not downright China hostile. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen, Charles Michel, before, and also Angela Merkel in, in Germany, before they held the virtual summit, they were drowned under letters and messages from all types of uh, political leaders within the European Parliament, asking them to be tough with China. They say, now we need to be tough. Uh, being understanding and being patient has obviously been mistaken with being weak. So now we need to be tough. And those leaders are, they are feeling this pressure. I mean, Europe, it's not like China. They have to answer to constituents. They have to build alliances to be reelected. So they have to listen to this kind of pressure. And the temptation is very big to, uh, to, to agree to that. So we really, uh, in terms of EU-China relations, we are really at a crossroads now. Uh, I think there's really two ways and two very opposite ways that things can go down from now on. Either the fact that China has been alienating most of its trade partners in the span of six months with their wolf warrior diplomacy, either this creates a realization in Beijing that they may have gone too far and that they cannot afford to make the whole, the entire planet Earth as an, an opponent, which means that the conditions for reciprocity might be better now than before, or they could go unfortunately, the way many communist governments have been going before, which is becoming even more radical, and we could have uh, even worse relationships with China from now on. I think we are at a crossroads. Um, there's not much that can be uh, negotiated in the details. Uh, the Europeans are really adamant that we need to go back to square one and talk about values, talk about principles before talking about whether we can buy this bank or we can invest in this agricultural company. Uh, we need to go back to basis. And this is what China has the hardest time accepting. They don't want to talk about uh, principles. They don't want to talk about Xinjiang. They don't want to talk about Hong Kong. They don't want to talk about Taiwan. Uh, the problem is that this is pretty much all European leaders want to talk about now. They want to make it clear that we have we can have an agreement, we can have an understanding on this before we start, we can start talking about the rest. And uh, with these challenging views, uh, I realize that they are challenging. They may not be very optimistic. I uh, give the floor back, and I would be happy to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your this 
wonderful uh, lecture, Mr. Michelon, very insightful. Uh, before uh, giving the word to Professor Aquino, I, I would like to ask you just one question uh, on Germany. Uh, of course, it's the biggest country in the European Union. So uh, do you think Germany will block out Huawei from uh, participating in the building of 5G, of its 5G infrastructure? Uh, uh, Germany, it's an extremely uh, interesting example because, as you say, it is the biggest economy, but it's also the country that has the most to lose in, uh, in a damaged relationship with China. Uh, Germany is the country that exports the most uh, to China in absolute terms and in relative terms to their total exports. It is the country that is the most exposed to imports uh, from China. So it's definitely the country that has the most to lose. And it's no surprise that is the country uh, where the leaders, the political leaders have been the most careful up until now. They were really the latest one to become critical of China. They waited until the French did so, they waited until the Italians did so, until the Czechs did so, until the Danes, until the Spaniards did so. Uh, they wanted to be critical, I would say the last. Uh, they didn't want to throw the first stone, uh, definitely not. Um, they have a lot to lose. Um, in terms of 5G, uh, it's interesting because uh, it may be actually China that forces them to come clean. Because the way the Germans have been communicating on whether or not they could allow Huawei in the 5G deployment in Germany has been totally uh, impossible to understand. The message is not clear. It's like uh, we understand uh, we understand the worries. On the other hand, we don't have any proof that it's dangerous. Uh, we don't see why they could not. On the other hand, we do see some risks. Um, the the war of uh, influence in this particular uh, case of, uh, of of Huawei it's extremely violent in the in in Germany. Actually, uh, the ex president of one of the largest uh, telecom authorities in Germany is now working for a Huawei lab in Germany. So we have now German ex administrators working for Huawei interests. So there's really a war of influence going on. But my take, my guess is that it could be China forcing Germany to give a clear answer, even if it's at the price of forcing them to say, okay, so you're out. But they will want to know who they can count on and who they cannot count on. Because Huawei is in a very tight spot now. Uh, the experience they are gathering in Europe and the responses they're having in Europe, it's starting to have an effect on other regions. I know for a fact that some governments, some authorities, telecom authorities in Africa, in Latin America, are looking at what telecom authorities are in Europe are doing. Just as an example, I mean, it's natural. You always want, when you're not sure what to do, you say, okay, let's see what the neighbor is doing. Maybe he knows more than me. Uh, so it, that could be, and Huawei knows that if all those countries are falling to the US camp of blocking Huawei, that could have a major impact on what they are able to do in Africa, in the Middle East, uh, in uh, South Asia, in Latin America. So they might be tempted to force an answer from Germany. And the answer, if Germany is put in a corner you have to say yes or no right now, clearly. Well, then I have to resort to a good old, okay, no, in that case. Let's be safe. Let's say no. If, if Ericsson and Nokia can win the markets, win uh, the tenders in most of the European 5G uh, contests, then why not go ahead for Germany and say, okay, that's going to be Ericsson or Nokia too. At least we're going to have something that is coherent throughout Europe in technical terms, and we don't make the US as enemies. Because you have to remember that the European dependence on US technology, it's as much important, if not even more important than dependence to Chinese technology. Uh, we depend much more on what Google can do, on what the Facebooks and the GAFAM are able to do in Europe than what the Tencents or the Alibabas or the Huawei can do. So uh, at the, in the end, uh, we might have to throw them a big fat no across the board to just end this as a topic of discussion and move on to other topics. This is my take. Thank you for your interesting point of view. Okay, so now uh, we're, uh, I'm going to give a word to Professor Aguino for some comments on your lecture. Thank you so much, Professor Aguino. Uh, thanks again, Nicolas. Very, very interesting and very comprehensive lecture about 
China uh, European Union relation. Yeah, in fact, the, what you said at the beginning was very, very interesting. No, uh, Europe, uh, the European Union, especially, does not want to become a battlefield, a battleground, but it wants to be a player. No? Yeah, that's very important because, you know, usually we talk about confrontation between United States and China, or in fact, they are the two biggest economies in the world. They are the two biggest trade partners, but let's not forget about the European Union and, and, and people all over the world want also another alternative also. So we don't want just to choose between China and the United States. So we need a strong Europe. Really. So that, that's very, very important to have Europe uh, as a player. Really. So, and also not only for that, because uh, if Europe Union as, as, as big as, as it is, is forced to choose between United States and China, what's going to happen with a small country like Peru, for example? <laughs> so we need to a strong Europe so they can give some guidance, for example, for us. Okay? But having said that, as you also said, uh, 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 there are many countries within the uh, European Union. No? You said, for example, the case of Italy, that at the beginning of the pandemic, they felt that they were not receiving enough help from the biggest countries, Germany, the richest country, France, so they went to China. So China was very also very intelligent to use that kind of things to advance its interests. But it is not only... E e e Italy, as you know, it's Greece, for example. No, they have very big investment, Chinese investment in Greece. In fact, it is said that the China, the big, big period port that the China companies have both there, it's going to be a string of sports surrounding all, all Europe. So no, it is not only the Italy, there are several circles, but, but it is not only that the way, you know, in, in, in China, they formed some years ago, this kind of co cooperation between China, and Central and Eastern European countries, okay? Mm -hmm. not, not only Greece, but the former, for example, Soviet Union Republic. So China, some people said, China want to divide Europe, okay? <laughs> so they can pick up, you know, it's very, very, very big for big countries, all big countries do that. Instead of, of finding with a, a unified group, they want to pick fight with small countries so they can easily win, really. But of course, it, it is not easy for Europe to present a unified front. As you said in the last uh, the question given by Maria, in the case of Germany, for example, I was reading, for example, uh, in, in, that in the beginning of this uh, year, or in the first half of the year, uh, Germany, uh, China has become for Germany the biggest export market. It is incredible. So Germany, every time, is relying more and more in, 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 in China, and as you also said, the, the relation between Germany and China are not that easily. For example, some years ago, I, I guess five, six years ago, uh, a Chinese company, Mide, I guess, both a KUKA robot company, and some people said it, it's another example of China <laughs> taking advantage of, of a company because Germany is, is one of the biggest industrial powers in, in, in the world, in, in Europe, especially in this kind of technological field. So it is not easy how to, uh, uh, China, uh, German is going to, to balance no? its uh, interest as a member of, uh, the biggest member, and, and, and so for some people, they, they have the biggest responsibility in Europe, and also it's growing dependence in China. Also, I was reading, for example, that Volkswagen, for example, or Daimler, Benz, or BMW, they sell 40% of all their cars in China. So China, for, China, for China is becoming more and more important for, for Germany. And as we all know, and you have said, China know how to reward their friends and <laughs> to punish their enemies. So exactly. yeah, I, I, you also mentioned at the beginning the case of Norway. And, and we know Norway some, some years ago a problem in China because they gave a, no, 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 they gave some uh, uh, price to some Chinese dissidents and, and China cut or extinguished the export of Norway salmon, for example. So mm -hmm. it is very, very complicated, the relationship with them. So Europe is a very important player. It should be a very important player. That I, I always said we should not rely or depend on only United States or China. We need a strong Europe who can present an alternative or can mediate even, it can have a role of mediation between these two Big powers, no, 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 no other country can, can do that. The, the only country that can be between United States and China could be Europe, but a unified in Europe, a strong yeah. Europe. So that's very important yes. that Europe have a unified. Okay. So then is the question of Huawei. 
Yeah, this is a very also very uh, uh, complicated issue. Uh, we know United States have a strong interest of blocking away from the uh, 5G building sector all over the world, where it is said that it, it was the reason that Britain uh, adopted that. Even in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Singapore have done that. Also, you, you did a review of which countries in, in Europe are, are going to adopt that. But anyway, I see in that case that uh, perhaps uh, many European Union countries perhaps will adopt uh, not Huawei because they have a competitor. They have uh, Ericsson, they have uh, Nokia, as you said. But what about the, the East and Central European countries? I'm, I'm afraid they will choose the, the, the Chinese alternative, not because it, Huawei is the, the, the best one. I, I think Huawei is a very good player, but perhaps they are more dependent on China to do that, okay? So that brings me to my last uh, question. What can do another country? So, so we really were very, very worried because, uh, you know, China now is the biggest uh, export market. I was reading for more than half of all the countries in the world especially many, many countries in, in, in Africa, many, many countries in Asia, especially in East, East all, more, nearly all East Asian countries are more dependent on China. In, in, in Peru, there are six or seven, but more countries are dependent on, on, on China. And especially it's going to be the case nowadays because you know, this pandemic have brought so much damage to the world economy. The, the world economy is going to decrease by a five, four percentage points this year. The only biggest economy that's going to grow is China. So there is no other alternative market. Okay, Germany, I mean, European Union, United States, at least this year, it isn't going to be a very attractive market to mm. uh, 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 sporting, uh, developing sporting countries. Not only that, something, for example, that I am very concerned is that, you know, many Latin American countries, and it's also the case of many African countries, because of the uh, underdeveloped economic structure, they don't export manufacturing. They export yes raw materials, okay? And as you know, United States, uh, 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 European unions, they are moving, they, they have been moving from many years ago from a manufacturing sector to service sector. So all their factories, they have moved to another country, okay? So which are the region, which are the countries that demands raw materials? It is China. We hope it will be India also, but actually it is China. So for countries like us, there is no other market than China. As, as, as long as we continue exporting just raw material, of course, we export manufacturing wood, we could export to the European Union. So that is the question, what's going to happen? So just uh, to finish, can you give us <laughs> the very countries a word of advice basing on what the European Union can do? Or, or you, you, uh, you, you know very well this China relationship with the world. What can we expect with, with, with China? Because yeah, China, as you let me say, China, it seems, uh, and also United States, they are pushing all countries to choose between mm. uh, yeah. both of them. So what's going to happen with us? <laughs> that is a question that everybody wants to know. Thank well, you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Akin, for, for those. Uh, I, I'm hearing uh, three three questions, so I'm going to answer it in, in three parts. To, first of all, to go back to Germany uh, and to make a link with uh, with uh, with the question of from uh, Mrs. Ostolo. Um, Germany, it's, uh, it's fascinating because, as I said, uh, and as you pointed out again, uh, the dependency uh, that, uh, Ger that the German economy has built with China, it's tremendous and it's one of the major uh, weakness of Europe right now. As a matter of fact, um, a German think tank uh, focusing on China called Merix uh, put uh -huh. out a report, a very interesting report, and uh, their executive director, who is he has the ears of uh, many uh, European uh, political leaders. He's actually saying very clearly that Germany is the weak link in Europe mm -hmm. when it comes to relationship with China. And within Germany, it's the automobile industry, which is the weak link. And within the automobile industry, it's Volkswagen, which is the weak link. So basically he's summarizing the weakness that the European Union has with China with Volkswagen is way too dependent on the Chinese market for the Europeans as a whole to have a bar, uh, to have a say, to have the power to impose what they want to the Chinese. Uh, and anybody who's been to China over the over the past few years, I mean, we can witness in the street the market shares that Volkswagen has in the automobile market in China. So that really summarizes uh, how 
Germany has become a major weakness. And this is actually one of the main criticism that most of the European uh, member countries have towards Germany. They're saying you're weighing way too much and you're making us make the wrong decisions. Basically, you're shooting us in the foot with your dependency on China. Something that is very interesting and that happened about the same time that the virtual summit uh, occurred last Monday is that Germany, through Angela Merkel, started talking about a new Indo-Pacific policy. We all know what Indo-Pacific means. Indo-Pacific is a synonym for China containment. So it is interesting and it goes actually to your last point, which is how do we deal with China dominance in world trade? Uh, what is the future? I do think that we are seeing signs that Europe is waking up to the reality that globalization, it's over, it's the end. Uh, COVID-19 killed globalization as we knew it. Uh, we are going to towards a world where you're gonna have several areas doing trade within themselves and with little trades between the different areas. Uh, LADAM will be doing trade on the American continent mostly. Africa will be doing trade increasingly within Africa, maybe uh, with a little bit of a, a European connection, but that's gonna be lowered with, compared with what we've had pre-COVID. And Asia will be doing trade mostly within itself. I think we're gonna have uh, three or four trading uh, trading zones, uh, as opposed to one big world trading, uh, trading together. So I, I think this is exactly uh, what we, what the Europeans are realizing. And the fact that Germany is slowly or at, moving towards, or at least talking about an Indo-Pacific uh, policy is a realization as exactly as you said, Professor Aquino, uh, as much as we need a strong Europe, we need a strong Japan, we need a strong India. Those are countries that are big enough, powerful enough, developed enough, and have enough potential to be an alternative to just the US and China. And the Europeans are moving towards that. That's exactly what Indo-Pacific means for us. Um, and I'm not talking about business alone, also in terms of uh, military strategy, France is getting closer to the Quad Security Alliance with Japan, US, and Australia. We are being very, very cozy with them because of the fleet France has uh, in the Pacific with the French Polynesia. So across the board, in terms of trade, in terms of security alliances, uh, we are really trying to go towards a bigger containment of China. The one point is that I'm, I'm still not seeing any move towards freeing ourselves from US influence. We're trying to free ourselves from Chinese influence, Chinese dependence, but we're not trying to do anything substantial to free ourselves as Europeans from US influence. And that's basically the nature of the political rift in uh, Europe right now. Uh, a lot of Europeans are saying, yes, China is dangerous, yes, Russia is dangerous, but so is the US. So we got to get closer to Japan, to India, to LADAM, to Africa, because those are our real alternatives. And then um, about Central Europe and Huawei, uh, I would beg to differ uh, from you, Professor Aquino. Uh, my feeling is that you don't have anything as anti-Chinese as a Central European country in 2020. Uh, those are the most anti-China governments you can get in Europe these days. Uh, the Czech Republic, Poland, uh, Romania are totally, totally aligned on the US, 1000%, for many reasons, many reasons. One reason which is very important, and you, the listeners might wonder why we're mentioning this, because uh, this has nothing to do with business, it's freedom of religion. Central European countries are staunchly Catholic, Roman Catholic, they do not like to, do, to deal with countries that suppress freedom of religion like China does. They dislike the way China treats uh, Christians in their own country. So that's one very basic reason. A lot of Czechs and Poles that I've talked to about this, I told them, uh, do you share this opposition that your government has uh, with China? They said, yes, absolutely yes. And I told them, what's the reason? I mean, China exports a lot. I mean, they export a lot of technology uh, to your countries. You're benefiting from it. They say, yeah, but we are Catholics. 
and we don't like the way they treat Christians in China. That's number one reason. The number two reason is obviously that those countries do not like the way China is causing up with Russia. And you know the history that those countries have with Russia. Uh, as much as Western Europe, uh, a lot of people in the population of Western Europe, they don't like the way their governments treat Russia. We believe that Russia should be an ally. We believe Russia is a European country. In Central Europe, for them, Russia is ex-USSR, the ex the old invader. So any occasion they have in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Slovakia, in Hungary, they want to get closer to the US, if anything else. So because China is closing up, is trying to build some sort of a front with Russia, that's another reason why those Central European countries uh, um, uh, reject, uh, re reject Chinese influence. So when it comes to adopting Huawei in 5G, I mean, time will tell, but I would be extremely surprised because as I said in my presentation, some of the Central European countries were actually the first ones to be very clear about their dislike of the presence of Huawei in their 5G, uh, in their 5G uh, uh, network. And they were very clear about this They saying, there will not be Huawei hardware in our systems. Forget about this. So I would have to differ on this. And then to go back to the last point of, uh, of you know, where are we going uh, from here in terms of globalization and in terms of, um, in terms of trade opportunities, um, I think we're all in for a very rough ride. I wouldn't like to be a Latin American economy right now. I wouldn't like to be an African economy right now because indeed where, who is going to buy our raw materials? Uh, the US is not able to, the, I mean, the, the economic cycle is not good enough. In Europe, we are in the middle of a multifaceted crisis, a crisis of identity, an economic crisis, a crisis of our social system. Um, Europe, from looking from the inside, is very close to some sort of a collapse of, the, of our societies. So we're certainly not going to be able to buy all the raw materials. I mean, uh, all our factories have fled. We've outsourced all our industries to developing countries. So first, we would have to repatriate all industries before we can even start thinking of buying coal or, uh, or lithium uh, from, from Latin America. So uh, I wouldn't like to be those countries, but uh, I, I have to say I'm at least as worried for Europe as I am for Latin America. Um, the ride is gonna be extremely rough. I think all our economies for different reasons, we all, we were intoxicated on uh, globalization as it was just before up until COVID-19. And just like any person who's intoxicated, who's addicted, um, getting out, getting rid of the drug is gonna be extremely painful. Our organism, our bodies got used to that. Our economies got dependent on it full, uh, full time. Uh, so getting rid of it. Um, much of the talk right now in Europe is how far can we go in repatriating our factories? Even the Japanese, you've heard that they've put out a, a program, a financial assistance program to encourage Japanese companies to repatriate or at least send their factories elsewhere out of China. In Europe, there's no way we can do that. First of all, there's no way we can finance it and there's no way we can technically do it. The, the workforce is way too expensive. I mean, are we gonna repatriate the factories from Peugeot, from Wuhan and bring them back to France? No way. There's no way we can do that. The best we could do is maybe put them in Morocco, in Tunisia. Um, that's the best we could do. But that's not going to create any jobs in France. So this is not going to solve our problem, which is where are we going to get the jobs from? How are we going to finance our social security systems? And this is the main problem that Europe has right now. So uh, yeah, fasten, uh, fasten. Uh, we should all fasten our seatbelts because the ride is going to be very rough, very rough. And the U.S. is not going to be able to, to help us on this, even uh, if it was just a calculation on their part, so that's to make sure that we don't fall uh, under Chinese influence. Even if they wanted to, they could not help Europe. There's no way, there's nothing they can do. And I suspect, I'm not a Latin America specialist, far from it, but I suspect that's the same with Latin America. I honestly don't see what they could do to help Latin America, if only if they wanted to uh, decrease Chinese influence in LATAM, what could they do? Uh, yeah, uh, 
Yeah, very, very interesting, uh, Nicolas, your point of view. Yeah, just, just two things. I, 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 I was uh, uh, smiling a little when you said Germany is the weakest link in, in the relationship of Europe with, with China. But I have also a thing that uh, in the relationship of uh, Europe Union with Russia, German also, in a sense, we can because they are very big dependent on Russian gas and <laughs> oil. So, yeah, well, Germany is a big country. Ger Germany so, is yeah, always the weakest link. It's always the weakest link for every topic you can find. <laughs> Germany is usually the weakest link, but it's so true. I was, I was my own. And the second <laughs> thing is that, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you said very interesting about the Indo-Pacific. Yeah, but also you you you, you mentioned uh, before uh, the question is that uh, China see the Indo-Pacific as a kind of containment against it. So it dislikes so much really. But anyway, in, in the last year, in the last month, there have been this friction between India and China. So that's why the Indo-Pacific that there was in a sense dormant have become again very active, not, not under Australia, Japan, United States and India, but also other countries want to join that even uh, I guess the Deputy Secretary of State of the United States was in a webinar with China, in India officer, and he floated the idea of making this Indo-Pacific country organize something like a NATO alike alliance. But of course, if that's the case, China will not like it really. So it's very, very interesting. Yeah, just to, to, to finish, thanks for mentioning the Indo-Pacific and just to renew an <laughs> invitation on 21, we have the two big experts I get in Asia, in, in Indo-Pacific, will be our lecturers on the webinar in the center of Asia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, we, have, we have one question from Facebook. So here it is, it's uh, Juan David Mora Peña is asking, uh, I'm watching you from Colombia. Uh, I'm wondering in Russia's position, do you think it's good to have China upgrading its relations in Europe? Is China a friend or a foe for Russia in the European scenario? Uh, a very interesting question. It's um, to, to, at least to, from the European standpoint, we look at uh, the closeness, the recent closeness between Russia and uh, China as everything but real friendship. It's like an arranged marriage uh, just to get the papers. Um, it's, it's really, naturally, those are two countries that have always been extremely suspicious of each other, even when both were communists. Uh, one was following a different brand of communism from the other one. Maoism never really got along with Leninism. Uh, so they've always looked at each other from a very suspicious point of view. The problem with Russia is that they have tremendous power to annoy their neighbors. Uh, they don't have the market, they don't have uh, the financial sector strength, but they have the power through their technology, through uh, their weaponry systems, through their excellence in information warfare that they honed during the communism times. They have this fantastic power to make life miserable for anyone. Whereas China can offer a solution, they can do more than that. So those, those are two powers who, in the current situation where the US is declaring trade and technological war against them, if not more soon, unfortunately, in this context, it is natural that it would come together. It's like the two guys that nobody wants to talk about in school, well, they're gonna end up talking together. It doesn't mean that they will become friends. Um, and there are many reasons uh, why uh, I would suspect that this friendship will remain extremely fragile. And that's exactly what we're thinking in Europe. And that's why we are very critical of the way uh, European governments are falling under US influence by manufacturing Russia as an enemy. We are saying, in, many people are saying in Europe, and I'm part of them, Russia does not have to be an enemy. We don't. We can make it an enemy if we keep doing like this, but it doesn't have to be. The main problem with, with being NATO, uh, we are, when, they, when Russia basically put down the Pact of Warsaw, uh, the agreement was that we would not expand NATO to their borders. 
we promised we wouldn't. And what did we do? We did expand NATO right to their borders with the Baltic states, etc. So um, to be fair, Russia has very little reasons to believe that Europe is free of its decisions. Uh, they know that we are under US and NATO influence. And that plays in China's favor uh, at the moment. But I wouldn't invest too much on that relationship because that relationship is extremely fragile. Look at the way uh, they've worked or actually did not work together during the COVID, the height of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, actually, the Russians were criticizing the Chinese for the management of the pandemic. They were basically, you know, having the same type of communication as uh, Europeans and Americans saying that it, it is China's fault. They should have been able to uh, contain this. They should have uh, collaborated better with WHO. Uh, you honestly wouldn't tell the difference between Chinese, between Russian communication on this and uh, European communication. So I think this alliance is very weak. It's an alliance of opportunity, uh, but if the, if the context changes, and I would be very interested to see uh, what kind of leverage we have on Russia through India, I think for the West, an alliance with India could make sure that Russia at least remains neutral towards Europe. Uh, we could not have the same friend and fight against each other. So I think uh, India could have that uh, role to play to calm Russia down and to make sure that they do not make, they do not become an enemy when we already have to deal with, uh, with China, which is a, a very difficult right now. Okay, uh, I think there are no more questions. Uh, we can finish, I think, here the, the lecture. Uh, thank you so much again, Mr. Nicolás, for your insightful conference. And uh, I give the word to Professor Aquino if you want to say something to end this. Uh, no, just to say thanks to Nicolás, very, very interesting thing. Yes. I think we have learned a lot about China, uh, not only about China uh, European relationship, but you also have give some ideas about what can we expect of the uh, situation from now on. Yeah, you are right that uh, we are going to experience uh, a very tumultuous time. And uh, well, uh, some people think that perhaps uh, with a new president in, in, in United States, something can change, but other people said not really, just the United States confrontation, China confrontation is going for a, a long time. So mm. yes, we, hope that <laughs> American countries, as you really say, we're very exposed to, to both. We are the, the backyard of the United States, but we are growing more and more dependent on China. So we hope we can have an alternative. And that alternative, if any, could be just the European Union. So really, we expect so much from the European Union. So we hope for the best for, for, for your country. And Thanks, uh, Nicola. It's very, very interesting. Thank you, Professor Aquino, and uh, thank you, Mrs. Ostolo. And I would say as the last thing uh, to, uh, to, to our Latin American uh, listeners, uh, if I was Latin American, I would build uh, very heavily and very actively my relationship with other Asian powers, such as uh, Japan, such as India. Those are countries that I think have the power and the willingness not only to be a positive force in Latin America, but also the willingness to diminish Chinese uh, influence. So those, I think, are two natural allies. Uh, what's going to happen with the Pacific Alliance could be interesting to see how it develops. And um, as a, if I was a Latin American, I think that's, uh, this is one axis, one strategy that would push uh, very, very hard, I think. Wise word. <laughs> We're going to Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you Hope for you me. can have again a, a meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Gracias a todos, gracias.